And everybody said? Amen. Yeah, woo, yeehaw, amen. That's all, that's all the same word, right? Uh, so, again, so excited that you're here this morning to worship with us. And, and I, I just pray that you really believe that and you understand that if you're a follower of Christ, that, uh, that you are the church and that we are, you know, the church, the people of God. And, that, uh, and I hope you understand and believe that maybe th- after this message you'll, you'll, you'll get that we are the hope of the world. And uh, so thanks for being here for, uh, to, to worship with us uh, today. This is our time where we kind of uh, pause and, and have opportunity to give back, uh, you know, um, just to focus and reset uh, ourselves for the coming week. Uh, and so thank you for uh, coming to this place. And it's also an opportunity for us to pray for and with each other. But so you may be seated. And let me just say uh, continually thank you for your generosity, your giving and Uh, We have opportunity to do that in so many ways. The giving box in the back as you come in or as you leave, you can place your offering in that or you can give online or set that up uh, with your bank. Whatever whatever way that works for you, just encourage you to to be giving if you're a part of this church, if you're a a member of this church, to be giving to support all that God is doing here at The Rock. Uh, It's also a time, though, that we set aside to, to, again, like I said, to to refocus on, you know, our our own walk and relationship with God, where we are uh, as we begin this new week, and just really to ask God to focus us to not only to to give uh, in our our financial way, but to to just give every every part of our lives back to Him in a relationship with Him and a relationship with others. And so uh, uh, join with me this morning as we uh, just take a time of prayer where we be still and know that He is God and that He is here with us. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for your presence here this morning and the opportunity, Father, that we have to worship you and to get excited about our relationship with you and the opportunity that we have to live that out in relationship with others, God. Father, as we continue to worship you this morning, as we open up your word, as we sing songs to you, as we just share with one another, Father, I pray that that you would draw us uh, closer to you that through this time today that we spend together as the body of Christ, Father, as people seeking and searching you and trying to understand more about who you are, God, that we would, uh, Father, that we would do that. We would understand that uh, your call on our life is to be in relationship with you, to, to be your church, to be a part of the family of God. So, God, I just pray that as we begin this new week, uh, Father, that you would help us and encourage us, Father, and uh, give us the, 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 the courage and the want to, to step out of here, Father, and be uh, encouraged and inspired to live out our faith in a way that makes a difference in the relationships around us that you have placed us in. Father, I pray for uh, the, the needs that are going around in our, in, you know, in our country and in our world, Father. I pray that you would be present in those places, that you would use your people, God, to to help uh, people that are hurting and suffering and that are dealing with loss and and heartache. God, I just pray that you would bring your peace. And Father, in individual lives here in this place and those that are listening online, Father, I just pray that you would... uh, that you would do the same in, in, in our individual lives, Father, that you would make your presence known, that you would bring your peace into situations and circumstances that are going on in our lives, that you'd bring your healing, that, God, you would fill us up with your presence so that, you, the Holy Spirit, you could fill us and produce in us uh, the fruit of his spirit, fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control and that Holy Spirit you would produce that in us and it would pour out of us onto the people we love um, the most and then onto the people that God you bring us into contact with each and every day especially this week So, Father, as we continue to worship you, help us to give our lives to you, to give our attention to you, to hear you speak into our hearts, and give us the courage to respond, to step into a closer, more intimate relationship with you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Scripture tells us that um, 
There's nothing, no thing that can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. That means we can't be snatched from his hand. We cannot be removed from his hand. We're in a relationship with him. We belong to him. That means we've been adopted. We're held. We're loved. We are his. We belong to him. So this part of worship this morning, as we sing, we just want to claim that, that we belong to our God, and he holds us, and he holds us tightly and will not let us go. So let's stand and sing his praises this morning.
mountain can be moved. They say these chains will never break, but they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no
praise you, God. You said it. That does it, Lord God. We believe you. We believe your promises, and we experienced that you are a promise-keeping God, so faithful to your word. And we come to you this morning so thankful that we can count on you. When the world seems to be spinning and turning and so much change, God, we know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we count on you. We thank you for all the ways that you love us and that you hold us and that you keep us. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. We're finishing off uh, the series that we've been in entitled Called. And, uh, you know, our theme verse for this was in, in Peter. It says, to this you were called. And, and uh, God is calling you to, to be in relationship with him, to be in that love relationship with him that that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with the heart that, um, that we believe and are justified. It's just as if we've never sinned when we come into that relationship with him. And it's with our mouth that we profess our faith in Jesus Christ and are saved. And we come into a family of God and we begin to belong, this calling to belong into, in the family of God where we can begin to grow in our relationship with him and become more and more like Jesus and, and have opportunity to really begin to discover his will, his purpose, his plan for our life. To this we are called. And so today I want to uh, finish off this series and, and talk to you about how he has called us to be the church, to be the, the, the people of God. Um, and, and so, uh, listen, I, I'm not, and, I, and I've shared this with you, but I'm not the best husband, all right? I mean, that's just the truth. I'm not the best. Kim says I am, but, um, but, I think, but I think there was a time that I thought I would be the best or the perfect, I should say. I'm not the perfect husband. The, the perfect husband. I, I, you know, I read all the books. I, I knew everything I needed to know about marriage and being a husband, and then I became one. And, right? and reality set in. And even now, when I do a series on relationships and I talk about marriage and how we, are, uh, we as the husbands are supposed to honor our wives and wash them with the word of God, Kim always reminds me that I might want to go back and listen to that one again. <laughs> that I'm not the perfect husband. That, that I'm selfish. I get sarcastic, right? Um, but here's the deal. Uh, I, I dream of getting better. Kim and I will celebrate 39 years of marriage this year, and, and so, yeah. And so I'll just say this publicly to her right here in front of all of you, uh, that, uh, Kim, I really believe that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I, you know, I, I, I uh, it just, uh, just seems like yesterday, when I asked her to be my wife, uh, we were coming back from Winter Haven, and many of you have heard this story, but we're coming back from eating supper at a restaurant in Winter Haven, coming back over here to Lake Morton where we had our first date, and I was going to do the proposal there. And, and Kim was working the, the midnight shift at the hospital at that time, so we're coming across, and she was tired, and so she fell asleep, and I thought, wow, that's God right there because I can practice what I'm going to say to her. And we're driving across, and it, you know, it's almost a full moon, and the, it was you know, kind of casting its light across the car, and it was coming right across her face, and it was just a beautiful moment, and I'm practicing and I'm looking over at her, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of her mouth, I see this huge drool kind of just come right out of the, out of the corner of her mouth. And uh, I just hesitated a moment right there and said, okay, is this, is this really the... And it was gone, and it's going, yes, it is. You know, I'm going to love her drool and all. And, and, uh, and, and so, Kim, I, I dream of, uh, you know, our 50th wedding anniversary. Right? <laughs> I dream of our 60th anniversary and, and for us to grow more and more in love with each other. I dream of us going to the nursing home together and sitting on the porch and holding hands and looking out over and seeing the drool come down your face. <laughs> to love you for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, sickness or health, drool and all, as long as we both shall live. Or if I go first for her and the boys to be standing at the graveside and saying he would and he 
he said he would, and he did. And I just dream of that. Uh, and so I, I really believe the best is yet to come. But I also would say I'm not the perfect dad. Um, I, I thought there was a time I knew everything there was about raising children. I read all the James Dobson books, and I knew I was ready and, until I had one. And I'm not the best dad, um, not the best granddad, right? But I'm dreaming of getting better every year, and I want my my boys and my daughters now that I have and my grandkids t to really know that the best is yet to come from dad and from granddad. I dream of being a better dad, a better granddad. Now listen, let's be honest. I'm not the perfect pastor. And Kim and I are not the perfect pastor couple. Right On December 2004, I thought I knew everything there was about starting the church. I finished seminary with my Master's of Divinity with a lot of help from Kimberly we had worked in the church, in church ministry for years, and I thought we, we really knew it all. But then in January 2005, we actually started the church in a funeral home. And I quickly learned I really didn't know anything. And these last 16 years have been so humbling for me. We, we've made many mistakes, and we're not perfect. And I really don't know how we got to this place except by the grace of God. And because of His grace, I really believe that the best is yet to come. And, and that we, together, we're, we're, we're only going to get better at, at loving and leading others into a growing relationship with the rock, Jesus Christ. So I want to talk to you this morning about how we, God has this continual call on us to be the church. And what that really looks like. I was in my Old Testament reading a, a few months ago, and I read, I was reading in Sephaniah, which is an Old Testament minor prophet. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Sephaniah. You might want to look in the, you know, in the contents there to find what page it's on. It's, it's way there in the back of the Old Testament. Uh, so turn there if you have it. We're going to be in chapter 3 uh, this morning. And then uh, Zephaniah was this prophet to Judah. And he was the prophet when the king Josiah was reigning, and Josiah was a godly king, and so that was a, a, just a good season of, of uh, uh, Judah's history. And Zephaniah was warning the, the Jewish people, the Judah, uh, warning Judah that the people of Judah that uh, the day of the Lord was coming, that the day of the Lord was coming, and that they needed to repent, that they needed to be turning back to God and living in right relationship with their God and being obedient to their God. And he warned them over and over. And then in ch <clears throat> chapter 3, he, gives, he begins to paint a picture of really what the people of God looks like and what the people of God will look like as if they live in right relationship with God. And I really believe it speaks to us even as the people of God, as the church. And so I'm just going to walk down uh, that third chapter in the book of Zephaniah, Zephaniah and give you really uh, these statements that I believe will help us to know uh, that the best is yet to come, that we are really called to be the church and that he is with us and going to walk with us through this. And so let's just jump in. Zephaniah says that we're called to be the church, to be the people of God, uh, uh, you know, called to be the church who embraces servanthood. Look in there, look at verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. And Zephaniah. How many of you have found Zephaniah? Yeah, most of you have cell phones and you just kind of went right to it. Right? Your smartphone. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful book. It says in verse 9, he says, Then will I purify the lips of the peoples that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. You see, he, he, God, he, he kind of power washes our souls and changes us forever. And we can call on his name and begin to serve shoulder to shoulder with each other. People embracing their call to serve. I think the scripture teaches that one of the most, one of the first marks of the Christian life is that they embrace their call to serve. That they, that they, that we together begin to stand shoulder to shoulder with other believers and serve a world that doesn't know Jesus Christ. Serving one another so that the body can make a difference. In Matthew 20, 26, Jesus says, uh, it's, you know, he's talking about living out and living their, their lives. He says, not so with you. And, and, and he's talking to the disciples, followers of Christ. He said, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must, you must be your, among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
And that verse has always convicted me. Because this is what I know about money. I would rather be served than serve. I don't know if you fall in that category. I love the way Kim serves me. I love the way you guys serve the church and, the, and, and serve the, the staff here. The whole idea of serving I really like. But it's hard to put into practice. Because God calls us to get rid of our selfishness and begin to replace it with a serving attitude. And so I want to challenge us. If you just give me one week on this, just just for one week, for the next seven days, I want you to kind of put on your servanthood radar or put servanthood on your radar. And when you wake up, would you just put on those servanthood glasses? And at the end of each day, I want you to write down. You can take a little three by five card and just write down. You don't have to send it to me. You don't have to you know share it with anybody. It's just for you. But write down five ways that you serve that day that you wouldn't have normally have done just on your card right you know the today i did it and just you know wake up with servanthood on your radar and and write those things down on that card i mean does that make sense Uh, what did you do that normally you wouldn't have done because the, the more you do it you know what happens in your soul you begin to go That felt right. That was the thing to do. And you begin to take these these little tiny steps. And here's what God does. He takes all those little steps and he brings about big spiritual growth. When it's on your radar and you're thinking about it, you begin to see opportunities all the time to serve. And Jesus says, you want to be great? Serve. You want to be first? Be last. You want to make it to the front? Start in the back. You want to stand out in life? You need to step down. And you start now. And you just start with little things. And that's my goal. That I would begin to embrace this call to to, to serve others and to serve my God. And here's what I want to do. My goal is I'm going to recognize that genuine servanthood has happened in my life when it happens without recognition and without reservation. That when I serve, I, I do it not to be noticed, and I serve with just without stopping, without reservation. I just go, go for it. And I would just be honest with you, I'm a long way off from that, but, but I want to be headed in that direction And I want to ask you to to join me in this journey to be on mission for God, to be his church by serving others without recognition and without reservation. That's why I don't want you to send it to me, you know, so I get up here and go, "Ooh, you know, look what Joe did this week. No, that we would just do it because that's who God has called us to be. And of course, Jesus is our greatest example, right? Jesus looked like a man, but he acted like God. And that should be our highest goal in life, to to be who we are as people, but to begin to act like our Savior. To be the greatest picture of Jesus in Scripture. And and that picture is when, when he stripped down and he took a basin of water and a towel and he began to wash dirty feet. You remember the story? But that's our job description as followers of Jesus. The all of me call to just wash dirty feet. To serve people in the way that they need to be served. Quietly, humbly, joyfully, behind the scene. And many of you have done that. Many of you have stooped down and washed feet throughout your life. Many of you done, have done that in this church, right? You pray for others, you, you, you greet, you, you, know, you watch out over the property during our services, uh, you, you teach our kids, you love on our students, uh, you, you name it. And, and, and I just want you to know, we couldn't do this without your servant leadership. But honestly, you don't just have to serve here to serve others in Jesus' name. Maybe it's just treating your spouse better. Paying more attention to your kids. Giving them quality time. Students, maybe it's a, a, a teacher or a coach. Uh, 
that you realize and you see either they've been doing it for a long time and they're tired and they're thinking about quitting and, and you know thinking about throwing in the towel and, and 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 maybe you just can encourage them with a simple note that says hey you're making a difference in my life you see that's our call is to to be the people of god to to understand that we are the church and wherever you go wherever you go that's where the church is. Jesus finishes that story about washing feet in John 13, 15. He says, as he says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. He says, follow my example. Go wash feet. And throughout the New Testament, he teaches us that as followers of Christ, each of us have been given at least one spiritual gift. And that gift is to be used with the rest of the body, shoulder to shoulder to serve one another. The second picture that Sephaniah uh, begins to, 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 to paint for us, I think, is um, that we're called to be a church, the church who embraces generosity. Look at verse 10. It says, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. And what I've discovered is that generosity is simply the practical expression of faith and hope and love. It's the way you express faith, hope, and love. 2 Corinthians 9.11 says, You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, Paul says, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And I'm not just talking about financial Right. I, I'm talking about being generous with our time, generous with our talent, generous with with our touch, generous with our treasure. Someone once said that the value of life isn't determined by how much I achieve or accumulate, but by how much of my life I give away. When I'm generous, I'm expressing my faith that God will take care of my needs so I don't mind giving something away. That's faith. When I give out of generosity, I express hope because I say, God, my hope is not, in, is not here, it is in heaven. And I'm storing up treasures in heaven. I know that, that my purpose of life is not just to get a bunch of things here on, on this earth. My hope isn't here, my hope is, is there. When I express, express generosity, I'm demonstrating love. You've heard me say many times, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Giving, generosity, is the hot heartbeat of love. And as a parent, more than anything else, I wanted my sons to learn generosity. I, I didn't want them to be stingy in life. There's really two kinds of people in life. There's givers and takers, and I so wanted my, my kids to be, to be givers. To give generously of their time, generously of their talent, generously of their opportunity, generous with their money, generous with their resources, generous with their praise, generous with their affirmation, generous, generous with their, their joy. I want them to live the generous life, not a self-centered, stingy, internal, it's all about me kind of life. I want them, I want them to live a life to live an unselfish life, not a self-centered, egotistical kind of life. And let me just say again that you are such a generous people. But I believe the best is, is yet to come. Because here's what I know about generosity. Generosity dis displays God's character. First Chronicles 29, 14 says, But who am I and who are, who are my people that we, would, we could give anything to you? Everything we have, God, has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. You see, our generosity displays the very character of our God. Generosity also changes me. I, I don't know if you've experienced that, but when you've given yourself away, your life away, your talent, your riches, whatever you've given away, when you've given it away, it, it begins to change you. The other thing I've learned is generosity develops my love. 1 John 3.16 says we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. 
So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? And then he says, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show that truth by our actions. It develops my love for others. It, it, generosity also demonstrates my faith. Malachi 3 says, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and there may be food, so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, he says, the Lord Almighty says, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. You see, dinner generosity, when I give my life away, it begins to develop my faith. I become stronger in my walk, in my relationship with God. I trust him more. I have a stronger faith. And then finally, I know that generosity draws me closer to God. And that's why I think Satan fights it. The Bible says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so just, you know, where is your heart this morning? It's wherever your treasure is. Just think about your own life. And maybe your treasure is in your house or in your business or your clothes or your children or your family, your career. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. And every time I begin to give to God, it moves me a little closer to him. It draws me closer to him because that's where my treasure is. God is much more interested in raising disciples than he is in raising dollars. And so when I give to God, guess where my heart goes? It goes toward God. It draws me closer. It's an act of worship. And the goal of generosity with our time and our talent and our treasure is, is it, it, to get his heart, to build a relationship, for him to be able to build a relationship with us. Generosity is this gateway to intimacy. It's one of the ways God connects our heart with his. The next picture that Seth and I gives us is to call to be a church who embraces, to be a people who embraces humility. Look at verse 11. It says, on that day you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me. Because I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the meek and the humble who trust in the name of the Lord. You see, God is opposed to the proud, right, and the haughty of, of every generation. But those who are meek and humble will be rewarded because they trust in God. Self-reliance and, and arrogance have no place among God's people. Religion, you know, throughout Scripture and throughout history is despised. God can't, you know, he, you know, we can't depend on religious system, but we have to focus on, on our Savior. We can't depend on what we can do. We must focus on what Jesus has already done. Not focus on our work, but focus on the work of Jesus Christ. Because that will make us, if we begin to focus on those other things, on them, we begin to focus on ourselves, that will make us proud instead of humble. And we need to humble ourselves at the cross. To understand it's all about grace and I get to serve and give because of the amazing grace of my Jesus. And so we must not get caught up in the system, but every day we focus on Jesus, our Savior, and that changes lives. You want to know how to grow in humility in, a, in kind of a me world? It's really going to require two things from you and two things from me. First, you're going to have to take a risk and acknowledge who you really are. And just acknowledge that to God, acknowledge it to other people. And, and that's something that you have to do routinely, repeatedly in your life. Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humble, but whoever can humble himself, really acknowledge who he or she really is, then they will be exalted. Now, it takes a risk to humble yourself. It takes a risk to say to another human being, this is who you think I am, but let me tell you who I really am takes a risk to fall on your knees before God who made you and say, God, this is who I really am. I'm a prideful, arrogant, selfish person. I deceive or I lust or I, you know, or I covet or I gossip or I wound people. God, there's this greed inside of me that's going so much, that, you know, that's doing so much that it's destructive. And I'm utterly dependent on who you are, God. 
and on your grace. I'm in a hole that I can't climb out of. It's so deep, only you, only you can lift me out. And that's hard, right? That's hard for us to do. That's hard for people to do who, who live with this illusion that says, I made myself who I am. I deserve all that I have. I worked for it. I did it myself, right? It, it reminds me of that CEO who pulled up to, to the gas station one day and his wife uh, and was with him in the car and she got out for a moment and the CEO noticed that she was talking to the gas station attendant there and they were having a rather pleasant conversation and after they were finished, she got back in the car and they started to drive away and her husband found out that the guy that she was talking to, the guy that she had dated when she was in high school. And so feeling rather prideful, her husband uh, eventually says to her, I bet I know what you're thinking. I bet you're thinking that you're pretty lucky that you married me, the CEO of a mega corporation and not a service station attendant. And she said, no. Actually, what I was thinking is that if I married him and not you, that he'd be the CEO of a mega corporation right now. And you would be working in a gas station. Listen, none of us would be anything without the God who made us. The God who gave us gifts and abilities. Without the God who gives us opportunities. Without the God who gave his only son for us. Paul says in Romans 6, 13, Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. You see, the key to humility is surrendering. It, it, it means, God, I'm going, I'm going to go with your plan for my life, not my own. God, I'm, I, I've got plans, I've got dreams, I've got goals, I've got ambitions, but I know that you put me on this earth for a reason, for a purpose, and God, I'm going to intentionally choose your plan for my life instead of my own. And I know, God, you, you, you know, you're not going to reveal that to me all at once. It's going to come a little bit at a time. So, God, I'm going to, take a, I'm going to just take it a step at a time. But I want to go with your plan, not mine. That's humility. That's called being humble, surrendering your plans to God. If you want to choose humility in a me world, humbly acknowledge who you really are to God and to others and just say, God, I come just as I am, just as I am. I bring my past and I surrender my future. I hand over my insecurities. I lay aside my circumstances. I abandon my excuses. I relinquish my pride just as I am, God. I offer my life to you. I humble myself before you and I come just as I am. So we have that choice to make today, right? We, we can choose humility in a selfish world. We can choose to, to break the back of pride that wrecks relationships, that walks right by people in need. We have to make a choice and say, God, this is who I really am, and I need you. And we have to choose humility to humble ourselves and serve others because we know that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The fourth picture that Sephaniah gives us of the people of God, you know, that we're called to be the church, to be the people of God who embraces authenticity. Look at verse 13. It says, The remnant, remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one, or, no one will make them afraid. Listen, we can pretend to be something that we're not, but God says, not, that's not who my people are. We have to quit playing games. We have to take off the mask and get real with Jesus. Yeah, you say, people say, how are you doing? And, and you say, fine. Or how's your marriage? It's great. Listen, when it's not true, don't speak lies. Be honest with each other. If things are not going well, be honest and say, I'm struggling this week. I, I don't know if God loves me anymore. My, my marriage is in trouble. I'm struggling with this addiction. I can't, I can't get past it. Can you help me? And that's why, you know, our small group ministry is so important here. That's what the church is supposed to be, living out the truth that everyone is welcome, but because nobody is perfect and anything is possible 
with Jesus. No lies. No deceit. Let's not deceive each other. Some of us are afraid or fearful because what's going on in our lives. And it's time to repent and, and turn back to God. Listen, God is pushing in on an issue, right? And he's not going to take you to where he wants you to be until you deal with that stuff right now. Right here. The fifth picture that Zephaniah gives us. He says that we're called to be the people of God, to be the church. A people who embraces celebration. I mean, we, we celebrate uh, our favorite teams, right? I mean, we're really good at that. Uh, and, you know, and our students were celebrating a little bit this morning here in worship, and that's, that's an awesome thing. We're, we, you know, he calls us to be a people who celebrate. Uh, but we do celebrate our teams. The other night when the lightning won in the last four seconds, and that dude passed it off the backboard to the guy streaking down, and he, he could have scored the goal. There was nobody in my house. I was actually watching it on tape. It had already happened, right? But I'm still going crazy around my house going, Whoa! And there was nobody to see it. I mean, I'm talking to nobody. But I lose it there, right? Watching that play because we celebrate our teams, right? We celebrate their victories. Well, listen, we got to celebrate our relationship with God. We're supposed to celebrate. The resurrection was the most amazing event in history. And we need to celebrate that. To be excited and passionate about our faith. That Jesus saved me. I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. He saved me and now I have a, I'm a brand new person. And that should cause us to celebrate. Uh, look what Zephaniah says in verse 14. He says, sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Listen, that's reason to celebrate. That's reason to celebrate. And finally, that sixth picture that Zephaniah gives us of the people of God and what he's calling us to is to be a church where God's presence is undeniable. Zephaniah 3.16 says, Oh, that day that they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. And I love, I love this. He will rejoice over you with singing. Stephaniah has given us this picture of the people of God where he says, listen, you're not going to be, you're not weak. You are strong. And I love, he said, you're not going to have a wimpy, limpy handshake. You're going to have a strong handshake. You know, he's saying, let's, listen, let's be strong. Let's be passionate. The Lord, your God is with you. And that's what I want. That the presence of God in my life would be undeniable. In your life would be undeniable. In this church, the presence of God would be undeniable. That's my prayer for us. And so how do we know that the presence of God is with us? He is mighty to save. If the presence of God is in a place, people will keep meeting Jesus. If the presence of God is, is, is with you, you will, be, you will continue to introduce Jesus to others. As you give God your life, He will take great delight in you and He will quiet you with His love, His peace. And He will be rejoicing over you with singing. That's the kind of God we serve. That's who he is calling us to be. To be that kind of people. To be his church. To be a church where God is rejoicing over us with singing. A, a church that is so attractive and refreshing that, you know, we, we wouldn't see empty seats. Called to be a church, a people. We don't just play religious games. 
but steps into our community every day and serves it. Who are really becoming the hands and feet of Jesus. People who find our find a relationship with God instead of being about religion. People that are living for God and it's no longer an obligation, but it's our heart's desires. Desire. The people where children don't feel forced to come to church, but maybe their parents might because the kids so want them to be there. Church, a people who are committed to growing in their faith in every part of their lives, discovering their gifts and allowing God to use them to make a difference. A people, a church where God uses just ordinary ones like you and me to do extraordinary things, really to serve each other in this community in a way that causes them to open up their hearts to God. A church, a people so compassionate that people are drawn from impossible situations into a loving circle of hope, into a, into a family that, that is with them and where they can begin to find answers and acceptance is given to them. A, a church, a people where a generation of teenagers can grow up in their relationship with Christ. And it's not just based on activities, but it's based on God's word. It's based, it's based on, you know, repentance and confession and growing in their faith. A people, a church where we as adults fall in love with God. And we become a place where you can use your gifts and creativity and love to share Jesus with your world. people, a church that understand that none of this can happen in our own strength, in our own ability. Instead, we are committed to prayer and being dependent upon the Holy Spirit. A people, a church that is called to, to make Jesus famous, to make sure all the glory goes to our God. That's who we're called to be. To be his church, his people, making a difference for him, really being the hope of the world. That's who he's calling you to be. And it begins with that love relationship with him. And then as you step into that and you begin to grow, he begins to fulfill his plan and purpose in this way. Be a people of service and generosity and humility and authenticity and a people that are that celebrate and are passionate about their faith. A people that are practice, practicing the very presence of their God. It's to this, it's to this that we are called. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's be the church. Pray with me, please. As we just spend this time in prayer, and I'm just going to ask each of you to just to bow your head and kind of draw a circle around you and just have a time talking to your God, to your Creator. You see, this calling that God has on your life begins, as I've said, with a personal relationship with Him, a personal love relationship with Him. That God demonstrated his love to you in such a way that each one of us in here, he, he wanted to be in a personal relationship, so he allowed his son, Jesus, to come and to live a perfect life and to die on a cross and to be raised again so that you and I, each one of us, could step into a love relationship with him. We could be forgiven and we could experience his mercy and his grace and we could really become a child of his. That's where the calling begins. 
God has done everything he's needed to do and all you have to do is say yes and step into that relationship with him. And that's my prayer. If you're here this morning and you know that you've never done that, that you've never confessed with your mouth that he is your Lord, you don't really believe that Jesus is the Son of God or you haven't, and this morning you feel a tug at your stomach as the Holy Spirit is drawing you to a relationship with Him to say, hey, I am real. I have done everything I've needed to do to be in relationship with you. I've said it. I've done it. Will you believe it? And right now, right where you sit, you can say yes to Him and invite Him in to be your Lord, to be your Savior. For most of us here in this room, we've made that decision, right? And so maybe God's Spirit is tugging at you this morning. And saying, hey, I, I really want the, I want the best for you. And I'm calling you to, to be my people, to, to really surrender everything to me. And maybe for you, it's just, you know, maybe it's in one of these areas that we've talked about this morning. Maybe it's in several of them, but maybe the tug of the Holy Spirit on your heart this morning is to, to really become a better servant. And just ask God to put your own selfishness behind you and humble yourself and allow Him to begin to use you to serve others, to wash other people's feet. Maybe for you, he's calling you to a real relationship, to be authentic with him and with others. Maybe you kind of wear a mask according to where you are. And he's saying, hey, let's just take off those masks. Let's be real. Let's step into relationship with others and let's share with them and allow them to share with us and let's strengthen each other so that we can stand shoulder to shoulder and begin to serve others and begin to build a healthy people. Maybe he's just calling you this morning to have a little more passion about your faith. To begin to celebrate your relationship with him and in relationship with others. Or maybe for you, it's just, you just need His presence more. And you just need to practice the very presence of God with you. And He's pulling you into that intimate relationship with Him and saying, I'm here, I am with you, I will never leave you or forsake you, but you have to, you have to practice the presence, being in my presence. You have to be talking and communicating with me through prayer. You have to be in my word. You have to be in a community of faith, surrounded by people of God. Just be in my presence. Allow me to be God. Father, you know the hearts of each person here in this place today and those that are listening now or will be listening, Father. And I pray, God, that through your word they are beginning to get a picture and understanding of who you are calling us to be. And that, God, you would give us the courage, each one of us, to step into that place that you are calling us to to a first time, forever relationship with you or to a surrendered, fully committed walk with you, God. Change us, O oh God, so that you can use us to be your hands, your feet, to be your presence in other people's life, that they may see Jesus and your love in us. In his name we pray. Amen. I want to give you opportunity to continue to respond to God's Spirit speaking into your heart this morning.
So we're going to stand and we're going to worship him in singing and stay in this attitude of prayer as we, as we worship him, as we respond to him. If you, need to pray, if you need prayer, this altar is open. I'd love for you to come and share with me a decision that you've made this morning so that we can come alongside of you and help strengthen that decision. But whatever decision that you've made, make sure that you share it with somebody so that together we can stand shoulder to shoulder being the church, the people that he's called us to be. And together we help each other to grow stronger, to love better. Together we, we love and we lead others and each other in a growing relationship with the rock, Jesus Christ. You respond as we stand and as we worship him, you respond.
thank you so much for being here this morning. We have many opportunities for you to, to serve as you go out. There'll be, you know, our women's ministry out there kind of, you know, wanting you to become a part of that. We have the baby, baby bottle thing still going on, and make sure you return those uh, filled up. Uh, mission trip uh, training today for our students as they keep preparing for Eagle Rock. Opportunity for you to pray for them. Uh, as you go out as well. Let's just kind of go out of here and let's be the church this week especially. Write those things down. Look at those. Allow those things to challenge you to become even a greater server of your God as you just uh, lean into the people that God has placed you in their lives and love them with the love of Jesus this week and be the church. Be the church. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much just for your presence here and for uh, allowing us today to, to practice the presence of you, God, uh, by joining together with the family of God. And I just pray, Father, that as we step into our week, that you'll give us opportunity to be your hands and feet, to wash people's feet, no matter how dirty they are, God, to, to be like Jesus in that. Father, we just want to be your church, your people, called to fulfill your plan on our lives. So help us to be uh, a people that surrender every day to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Set your room.